Hello and welcome to our webinar, Natural Potsilins in their Pacific Northwest and their beneficial uses. My name is Brendan Williams. I am the Research Program Administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. TREK leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, one of seven national university transportation centers funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. NITSI's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. NITSI consortium members are the University of Utah, University of Oregon, University of Arizona, University of Texas at Arlington, and Oregon Institute of Technology. We enjoy connecting our researchers to you, our audience, during this webinar, if we have any problems, please bear with us for a few moments. Our presenter today is Dr. Matthew Sleep. He is an Associate Professor of Civil Engineering at Oregon Institute of Technology. Dr. Sleep teaches courses in Civil Engineering Materials, Geotechnical Engineering, and Geology. His research includes the use of natural potsilins, risk and reliability, and engineering education. This Friday, we have a Friday transportation seminar starting at 11.30 a.m. It's presented by Aaron Golub and John MacArthur from Portland State University. It's titled Understanding Technology-Based Exclusion and Emerging Smart Mobility Systems. Our next webinar is June 2nd at 11 a.m. Pacific time. It'll be presented by Dr. Jennifer Dill and Nathan McNeil of Portland State University. It's titled Findings from 15 Years of Travel Surveys at Portland Area Transit-Oriented Development. All right, so an overview. Um, Dr. Sleep is going to present for about 40 minutes long. Um, after that, we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, in the GoToWebinar console, there's a questions, um, ability to submit questions to us, and we'll uh, try to get those answered at the end. Um, we are recording this webinar, and we will be posting the slides online. After the webinar is over, we'll send you an email with the link. Uh, if you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will be included in the post-webinar email. All right, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Matthew. Great, so thank you so much. Let me go ahead and get my slideshow started. All right, so uh, Brendan, just let me know um, if there are any issues that come up or if my slideshow isn't uh, being shown. So today, okay, great, thank you so much. So today we're gonna be talking about natural pozzolans in the Pacific Northwest and their beneficial uses. So this is a, um, a presentation that's gonna cover two separate um, research reports that were conducted for the National Institute for Transportation and Communities. So first I wanna start with some thank yous, of course. Um, thank you so much to the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, NITSI, for funding this work and for hosting this webinar. This is a, um, as we'll see today, this is a lot of materials work and I think it really advances the NITSI mission that was just discussed earlier. I'd also like to thank the Civil Engineering Department at Oregon Institute of Technology. We are a small uh, teaching focused institution, uh, teaching four, sometimes more classes a term, and it really takes a concerted effort on all members of the department uh, to have uh, research projects like this done. When I was at Virginia Tech finishing my PhD, I was talking to an, uh, an advisor there about how to be successful in academia. And they told me that you simply needed to find good students and get out of their way. 
And I think that all academics uh, to be successful really have to have good students. So I think Stephen Reed, who worked on this project with me before it was a funded project, Justin Millar, who simply added this to an existing project for me, Morgan Maisley, who had no problem every time I would say, yeah, I think we need about a dozen more of those tests, and Damian Madsen, who worked on this project for two years and was really instrumental in creating the data set that we'll talk about, which I think is one of the highlights of this work. So to begin with, um, just a quick kind of overview. What I'm gonna be talking about is using volcanic ash from Mount Mazama. Mount Mazama is what created Crater Lake National Park here in Southern Oregon in various transportation applications to increase access in a sustainable manner. All of this information can be found in these two final reports. The most recent is ADA Accessible Trail Improvement and the previous one is more on the use of this material as simply a natural pozzolan. So here's our agenda for the rest of the um, presentation. Um, we're going to be talking about a lot of these sort of like early 2000s bands. We're going to have a lot of thuds. Um, we're going to be talking about the location and motivation and process, the material itself, including the laboratory testing on the ash and different surfaces. Toward the end of the presentation, we'll look at the ADA Accessible Trail on the Oregon Institute of Technology campus. And then we'll go into the conclusions, sort of where do we go from here. So as part of this motivation, here is part of the four, um, four of the separate um, uh, interests of the NITSI mission um, on what they like to fund. So their funding research opportunities should increase access, um, shared use of infrastructure, innovation, and data. And I think that this project really hits on all four of these areas. Certainly, it focuses on having access and shared use of all of our transportation infrastructure. We really attempted to find an innovative use for this volcanic ash. And we wanted to develop a data set. And I think the, I'm most proud of the data set that was developed and is available for all engineers, researchers, planners, and designers in our final reports available uh, on the NITSI website. So in addition, I was looking for creating a sustainable solution. And um, we have three pillars of sustainability. I think the most widely understood one is the environmental protection aspect of sustainability here. But we also have um, social equity, and I have a real interest in social equity and access, allowing our transportation infrastructure to be accessed by all individuals, even those, um, even when people have uh, mobility challenges in the case of unpaved trails. And also I wanted to keep it local. Uh, when I moved to Oregon eight years ago, this was sort of a, a rallying cry, right, of keeping things local. And I wanted to find a use of some materials here in the Klamath Basin in Southern Oregon. Um, and I think we, we found a, an additional use for some of the volcanic ash that's prevalent here. So why use a natural pozzolan? I was in a, um, a presentation on some research uh, at a conference several months ago, and there was this really great presentation. And at the end of it, the, the simple question was asked is, well, why did you even start to look at this material? And so with a natural pozzolan, essentially a natural pozzolan, which is this volcanic ash, it can be used to either supplement or in some cases replace Portland cement in a concrete mix design. And anytime we can replace Portland cement, we're going to reduce both our carbon dioxide emissions and our embodied energy. And so I had a, a graduate student look at this using a spreadsheet calculator developed by the CGPR of Virginia Tech. And we really found that, you know, any a Portland cement is a manufactured product. You have to take materials from several different locations and heat them up in a furnace to thousands of degrees. And in the case of volcanic ash, right, the uh, volcano has already heated our material to thousands of degrees. And so therefore, we're, we're just going to have less embodied energy, and less carbon dioxide emissions anytime we can replace that Portland cement in whatever um, project that we're so let's move on to the location. So the location is here in Southern Oregon uh, in Klamath County where the Oregon Institute of Technology 
uh, campus, main campus is. In Klamath County, you will find Mount Mazama or Crater Lake National Park. It's a beautiful national park. The water is a blue, unlike you've ever seen before. It's a wonderful place to go visit. This is what it looks like uh, today. In fact, this is probably what it looks like today. There's likely still snow up there. And this is what geologists envisioned it looking like about 7,700 years ago. So we've had eruptive events at Mount Mazama starting about 400,000 years ago. Really the major eruption that created the lake that you see today that collapsed the caldera happened approximately 7,700 years ago. Very similar, um, if you were to view it, it would be very similar to what you might see watching videos of Mount St. Helens eruption, which we just saw was the anniversary of the eruption 40 years ago. This was a very um, felsic magma, it was a highly siliceous magma, and therefore had a lot of viscosity and had a very violent eruption. Very different from what you might see in a Hawaiian type eruption, more of a, a quiet type eruption with basaltic magmas. If we look at a geologic map of Crater Lake National Park, you see this, all of these different colors. Now this geologic map, all of these different colors represent different igneous geologies. And this type of, of map where you see many different colors and many different igneous geologies is very indicative of a volcanic environment where we have several different episodes, eruptive episodes that have occurred over the last 400,000 years. Now, in particular, what I'd like to point your attention to are these lighter colored pink deposits that are to the east of Crater Lake National Park. These are Holocene or recent pumice and ashfall deposits. And the reason why we see them at the surface on the east side of Crater Lake is that just like with the Mount St. Helens eruption, our predominating winds um, uh, 7,000 years ago were from the west to the east. And so here you see an approximate outline of where we might find relatively thick deposits of these pumice or vo volcanic ash airfall deposits. So you can see that it, it um, is much larger in scope than the Mount St. Helens eruption. It was a much larger physical eruption than the Mount St. Helens. Now, if we zoom back in to Southern Oregon, what we see here is an isopac map of the general thicknesses of these pumice airfall deposits. So here near the communities of Chamalt and Crescent, we see somewhere on the order of 10 to five foot thick deposits of these pumice airfalls. So we're really talking about a volcanic ash deposit. Now in these communities, the thickness of these deposits make them economically viable for surface mining. And that's actually what we see today. If you go up near the community of Chamalt, you'll see on this Google Earth image that I've highlighted here, several different surface mines or open pit mines uh, for these pumice and airfall volcanic ash deposits. These uh, mines currently I've spoken to some of these producers. They're currently focused on mining these as a lightweight pumice aggregate. So they're looking actually at mining the larger particles, the gravel sized particles of this pumice. Whereas I have been interested in the actual ash deposit, which are the fine grain, sort of the volcanic ash and dust. These producers actually view that as more of a byproduct. So they were very, very willing to give me just bags upon bags of this material for my work. So natural pozzolans have been around since the idea of concrete, since the idea of cements. And in fact, Marcus Vitruvius Polio in 70 BC wrote De Architectura on architecture or the 10 books of architecture. And in that thousands of year, thousands year old publication, Vitruvius specified that if you were making a building, you should use one part lime to three parts pozzolana for the mortar. And so that pozzolana is volcanic ash. So as we see, if you were to Google Roman concrete, you'd find some really fun and interesting YouTube videos. And you would note that the very first concretes and mortars that we used were actually lime and volcanic ash. We're sort of going full circle on this. There's been a resurgence in using this volcanic ash in our Portland cement uh, designs. In fact, the Texas Department of Transportation 
a very large user of Portland cement uh, in their transportation research projects have uh, sponsored some studies looking at Idaho volcanic ashes. And what they are looking for is a replacement for fly ash. They use fly ash in their Portland cement. Fly ash is a byproduct of coal combustion. And we're simply burning less coal now than we used to, and so we have less fly ash. And so therefore we're looking for a replacement for fly ash. But we've known for a long time the benefits of using natural pozzolan. Now, pozzolan is defined as, in and of itself, it's a siliceous material that has no cementitious properties, simply meaning that if I take volcanic ash and I mix it with water, I'm not going to get a hardened cementitious product. However, if I take that volcanic ash and I have it in the presence of a calcium hydroxide, then I'm going to get a cementitious product, a beneficial product. In addition to that, we have known for a long time the benefits of using these pozzolans like fly ash, everything from reduced heat of hydration um, to reducing the carbon footprint, as we've already talked about previously. Now, this process of a natural pozzolan is really simple. If you go to Home Depot and you buy a bag of Portland cement, it's a bag of gray powder. You take that bag of gray powder and you mix water, you're going to get this hydration reaction. So it's C3S plus water is going to give us CSH, which is the beneficial hardened product of Portland cement, and then calcium hydroxide. That calcium hydroxide is not necessarily one of the good pieces that we want in our concrete. And so if we use a pozzolan, then we're going to take some of that byproduct calcium hydroxide and allow it to react with the silica in our, in our uh, pozzolan and create more of that CSH, that beneficial product. I've been asking politely my concrete canoe team that I advise here at Oregon Tech to use volcanic ash in their mixed designs for several years. I think most often they just do it just to make me happy um, because I always want volcanic ash to be in our concrete canoe. So looking in at where we collected, um, in addition to getting materials from some of those pumice producers, we actually collected materials on our own. Uh, we collected materials in two separate locations based on that isopack thickness map of these pumice deposits that we looked at earlier. So here's material collection A, which is Northern Klamath County, just the east of Crater Lake. Again, you can see how nice it is to have very willing students who when we need more volcanic ash, they will go out despite the two and a half feet of snow and get more volcanic ash for us. And here's my material collection B. I collected this with the, um, uh, some help from the, the Forest Service. We really appreciate their willingness to allow us to collect these materials. And this is the kind of ash deposit that you would like to see if you were mining it economically. It's at the surface. This is an unwelded uh, deposit, so it is not welded and fused together. It's just a nice, sort of beautiful, fluffy volcanic ash. Now, the first step in this process was to see if this actually behaves like a natural pozzolan with some of those beneficial products that I talked about earlier. In particular, what we were concerned with are the chemical criteria, fineness criteria, how small is the particle, and then some strength criteria. What we will see is that chemically, this material is very much a natural pozzolan. And we can meet these required strengths if we have some processing to make that material a little bit finer. So here are our chemical analyses. What I'd like to point out here are, in this table on the left, we see the uh, majority of this material is silica, aluminum, and iron oxide which we need greater than 70% to be a natural pozzolan, and we're averaging about 90% of these three compounds. Very similar in composition to fly ash. So chemically, this material is certainly a natural pozzolan. Now, in order to qualify as natural pozzolan, according to ASTM, we also have to meet some strength requirements. And so here is Damian Matson. He is creating some mortar cubes um, from this material. As part of this project, we created uh, over 200 separate mortar cubes to test their unconfined compressive strength. These mortar cubes um, are created using water, Portland cement, and sand. 
And then we replace some of that Portland cement with the volcanic ash to see how much of a reduction we get in the strength. So let's look at some of these results. So what we're seeing here, these dark gray bars are for seven day cures and a 28 day cure. So these are the strengths of these mortar cubes using only Portland cement, water, and graded sand. Now, in order to classify as a pozzolan, if you replace 25% of that Portland cement with volcanic ash, then you have to be 75% of this control strength. So this slightly less dark gray bar represents that minimum control strength. And then these three lighter gray bars represent the strength of the mortar cubes with this replacement of volcanic ash. And so what we're looking at here are three different replacements. We're looking at the unprocessed material, the material that has been crushed and passed the number 200 sieve, and then the material that's been pulverized. So essentially what we're looking at are the strength of these mortar cubes as we increase the fineness of the volcanic ash. And so what you see here is that we do need to process this material in order to meet these strength requirements. In its natural state, this is what the material looks like. So you see we have some larger pieces of pumice that are just in this natural deposit. So we need um, a maximum of 34% retained on the number 325 sieve. This is a very, very, very small particle size. The 325 sieve is a very, very small screen. In its natural state, um, we had 17% passing the number 325. We needed 66%. However, this material is easily processed. So we used a sort of hobbyist gold mining crusher. This is a small gas powered engine that spins a couple of chains in this wheel at a relatively high RPM. And one pass of this material through this device would increase our fineness uh, from 17 to 58%. So even though we do have to process this material to meet these strength requirements, it's a minimal amount of Processing. Now, as I said, we did more than just our standard strength tests. We did over 200 of these mortar cubes, and all of this data is available in our final reports. But I do want to point out two really interesting pieces from our data sets. One is what happens when we continue to reduce that Portland cement um, by more than 25%. And then we'll also, what happens when we just forego Portland cement? and use something else, maybe something like a cooked oyster shell. We were looking for different sources of calcium hydroxide. So first, this is a really, really functional and usable piece of data. So in addition to looking at 25% replacement, we continue to replace the Portland cement with volcanic ash at ratios of 45, of 65, um, all the way up to 150% more volcanic ash than Portland cement. And then we also carried out the testing beyond the 28 days. And so you see here, we have uh, 42, 56, 70, and 84 day strengths. This is, um, what, we, what we get is a very predictable reduction in strength as we go from uh, 0 percent replacement to 150 percent replacement. So this graph can be used by engineers and designers and planners to at least get a basic idea of if you replace Portland cement with this volcanic ash, what kind of reductions in strengths can you anticipate? Now one other interesting piece of data is what happens if we just stop using Portland cement and use a different piece of calcium hydroxide? Now, the reason we wanted to do this is because we really wanted to quantify what is just the pozzolanic reaction between this volcanic ash and calcium hydroxide. When you mix Portland cement with the volcanic ash, you're gonna get the cementitious reaction of the Portland cement. But we wanted to quantify, well, what happens if you just don't use Portland cement? What is the reaction itself? And so that bottom line that you see there, the RC3 line, um, or the RC0 line, excuse me, represents just powdered oyster shell uh, in these mortar cubes. So essentially, if you just use oyster shells, which is a pure calcium hydroxide, you get no strength. 
But then if you increase volcanic ash in addition to that oyster shell, you're going to get increases in strength. So if you look at that top line, which is RC3, you can see that we get this really very clean increase in strength of a mortar cube using no Portland cement. So at 84 days of cure time, we were able to get an unconfined compressive strength of just about 350 PSI of a mortar cube using no Portland cement. Now that's a very weak mortar cube, However, what it does show is that without a doubt, this material is behaving like a natural pozzolan. We are getting that pozzolanic reaction even without the presence of Portland cement. So let's look at some of our innovative uses of this material, looking at if we can improve organic soils, some dust, abase, dust abatement procedures for unpaved gravel roadways, and then we'll move to our unpaved trail system. So first let's look at some organic soils. We had a project working with the Bureau of Land Management, looking at a levee access road just north of Upper Klamath Lake. This is an access road that separates a managed wetland into north and south areas. And this road was experiencing lots of subsidence and rutting, and they really needed it because they were using it to take water quality measurements of this managed wetland. So we wanted to see, could we introduce volcanic ash into the soil, get a pozzolanic reaction, and see if we can improve the strength of the soil. So we used a Harvard miniature device and replaced some of the soil with fly ash, volcanic ash, lime, a combination of lime and volcanic ash and Portland cement, and then cured them for both seven and 28 days to see if we can improve their strength. Here's the data that we got from this study. What you're seeing here, that red line, that represents the soil strength with no additives. So that's just sort of the compacted strength of the material. The bars on the left-hand side of the graph represent 5% replacement. In the middle, it's 10% replacement. And to the right is 15% replacement of all of these different materials that I just talked about. The fly ash, the volcanic ash, the lime, and the Portland cement. Now, what we see here is that we get pretty substantial increases in strength with our normal soil additives, Portland cement and lime. We really didn't want to use these soil additives in this area because this is a managed wetland. We didn't want to introduce substances that weren't naturally present in this environment. However, what we see is that the Mount Mazama ash alone is not increasing the strength appreciably. We look at the correlation coefficients, the Mount Mazama ash, it's less than one, but it is a positive value, meaning that it is increasing the strength. However, it's not increasing the strength very appreciable in comparison to both Portland cement and the lime. Essentially what this means is that in the presence of these highly organic soils, we don't get that pozzolanic reaction, which is something that we had a little bit of anticipation, we thought that might happen because organic soils kind of inhibit that pozzolanic reaction, but this really does confirm it that we need an alternate source of calcium hydroxide if we are to use this volcanic ash. Another area of study that we looked at is using this material to reduce dust of unpaved roadways. Unpaved roadways produce a lot of PM 2.5, that is a pollutant according to the EPA. And so what we looked at here is we had a control gravel specimen that on average had about 4% dust. We were able to get a 45% reduction in the amount of dust of these specimens just by adding a little bit of volcanic ash and lime. The volcanic ash and lime created that pozzolanic reaction. And as we've seen, even though it's a weak reaction, in, the terms of, in terms of dust abatement, it's just binding particles together. And that's all we need to do in order to reduce the dust of an unpaved roadway. If there's one area that I think that a lot more research can be done, it would be this area. This is something that I think um, is very beneficial. Right now, a lot of the products that we use in dust abatement, either we're using significant amounts of water on the roadway that is repeated, or we're using sort of a petroleum product, something really oily that binds the particles together. So I think this may be a sustainable solution for unpaved roadway dust improvement. So let's move on to this ADA accessible trail. 
this is some, some really, this was just a lot, this was fun research for me and my students to work on. So all trails are considered transportation facilities and thus they must be ADA accessible. Now, of course, there are some exclusions to this when it just remains physically impossible to have things like the slope be met for an ADA accessible trail. Now, what we were interested in here, what you see are all of these different characteristics that must be met in order to make a trail ADA accessible. So some of these are really easy to quantify, right? As engineers and planners and designers, we can calculate things like grade or width or vertical clearances. However, the surface of the trail itself is what is difficult to quantify. And that's what we were concerned with. If you look at the specific ADA requirements for what is the surface of a trail that is accessible, they use the words firmness, stability, and slip resistance, right? And as I know that in teaching engineering, anytime you quantify something with a word, I know students get really upset. They want to quantify things with numbers. And so firmness is the resistance of deformation, stability is the resistance of a movement, and then slip resistance is a frictional counterforce. So in order to quantify firmness and stability, what we relied on is what you see here. This is a beneficial designs rotational penetrometer. This measures firmness and stability. Firmness is measured um, by pressing the wheel that you see into the underlying surface with a calibrated spring and measuring the amount of deformation that takes place. And then it measures stability by rotating that wheel back and forth and measuring how much indentation occurs as you move that wheel back and forth. Now we saw a lot of variability, not hugely significant, but we did see some variability in our measurements with this device uh, simply because um, the size of the wheel and the size of the particle can really, really um, interact and influence these firmness and stability measurements. So here is our ADA accessible trail. Um, this is on the Oregon Institute of Technology campus. This is the, it's called the Geo Trail. It highlights some of our geothermal features and um, sustainable practices here at Oregon Tech. Now, what we wanted to do is we wanted a solution where we could apply it topically to the surface. And we relied on a topical application because we wanted to improve existing trails, firmness and stability to make them ADA compliant. And we wanted it to do it with um, a relatively low cost and sustainable solution. So we recognized early on in this project, that one of the things that's going to really influence the firmness and stability, a stability is the ability of this material to penetrate the surface, right? And so we did what we are calling pore tests. These pore tests, we did several hundred of these pore tests. Again, as I said, it's really beneficial to have great students. So we took seven different gradations of gravel and, and simply poured topically many different combinations of this Portland cement, volcanic ash, and water ratios. What we were attempting to do is correlate both the depth of penetration and the amount of bound material to some sort of predictable aggregate property. For example, if, I, if somebody were to ask me, what is the permeability of this gravel? What is the ability of this gravel to transmit water? I would simply say, well, we should rely on the D10 or the D5 size of that gravel and find an appropriate correlation. We hope to find a very similar correlation by performing such numerous tests. What we found, I think, is it did help us determine what the best water contents were for depth of penetration, but there was one variable that was just a little bit too difficult to quantify, and that was the viscosity of the material. It turns out the viscosity of water and the viscosity of all these different slurries we are testing is very different, and different amounts of Portland cement and volcanic ash have a big influence on the viscosity. And so we weren't able to come up with this very predictable relationship uh, between a highly readable gravel gradation uh, descriptor and um, what type of slurry you might use. However, we do have some guidance in our final report on what are beneficial water contents. 
So we created 12 separate, separate lots where we applied different cementitious mix, mixtures based on the results of these pore testings. We used 50, 60, and 70% water because the higher water contents uh, seemed to reduce the viscosity of this material and allowed us to get more penetration into the underlying gravel. And then as a control, you see here lot four, five, and six, we used clingstone amber, G3 soil stabilizer, and soil tack. These are polymer-based solutions for gravel stabilizations. These are the things that you could go to your sort of local nursery, um, apply them uh, to uh, something in your backyard and create, create a very firm and stable surface. Now, all of the data is in our final report, but what we did is we went out here and took measurements with that rotational penetrometer before application and then took um, weekly measurements of both firmness and stability um, of all of these separate lots over the course of 70 days. And so here is just one of the data sets. So what we're looking at here are changes to both the firmness and stability of the surface as quantified by that rotational penetrometer um, over 70 days. So what you see, um, there are a couple of things that I want to point out. One is that um, the commercially available stabilizers had a very positive effect on stability, over 50% increases in stability measurements. However, that stability measurement decreased from zero to 70 days. So when we started, that 50% number was much higher. Now, interestingly, all of these commercial-based stabilizers had a negative or very only small impact on the firmness, which is the ability of that uh, ro rotational penetrometer to indent the surface. And that's a really important conclusion because we would like, right, if firmness and stability are both related to the um, ADA accessibleness of this trail, we want uh, a topically applied solution to increase both of these numbers simultaneously. And even though um, the magnitude of our benefit from the Portland cement volcanic ash mixes were less than these values, they had a very similar effect on both the firmness and stability measurements, which I think is a very good finding. If we look at this a little bit further, what we're looking here at here on the left, this is simply the correlation between these two measurements for untreated and treated surface. What this shows is that there is a statistically significant difference between the firmness and stability measurement more so when you treat the surface with the commercial stabilizers than the untreated surface. Meaning that the, the commercial based stabilizers are influencing firmness and stability differently, whereas the Portland cement volcanic ash mixes are increasing um, both at the same level and the same amount essentially, which is a very, very positive result from this work. So looking to the future and some conclusions, Mount Mazama volcanic ash, we find this across Southern Oregon, and it's being mined at several locations as a pumice aggregate here in Southern Oregon, particularly it's an economically viable material. Chemically, this ash is certainly a natural pozzolan. It's a highly silicious uh, material. It, it's very much what we would expect from sort of a violent felsic eruption uh, like we had 7,700 years ago that created Crater Lake. Now, strength index testing does indicate that this material has a significant pozzolanic reaction. And that pozzolanic reaction becomes greater if we process this material into a finer product, which is certainly something that um, we would anticipate. This is a naturally occurring material, and so it's going to have lots of variability. In fact, this is one of the reasons why a lot of engineers, planners, and designers are a little bit hesitant to use something like volcanic ash in their mix designs. Because this is naturally occurring, it's just going to have a lot of variability. The, the more reduction in that variability um, we can create, then the more um, positive result we'll get because we can be assured of the outcome when we use it. And one interesting thing is that the long-term strength gains of these volcanic ash ashes are definitely present. 
between 42 and 84 days of curing, we see 17, sometimes 20% increases in strength at this long term, which is really important because if we place this volcanic ash onto a trail system, theoretically, we can anticipate long-term gains in strength as time goes on, which is going to increase um, the uh, sustainability of that trail system. From that data set, here's one of our uh, most useful um, predictions. This is a prediction of the strength of uh, uh, mortar cubes created with increasing amounts of volcanic ash. This can be used as just a starting point for creating different mortars. Uh, we didn't find, uh, in terms of ADA accessible trail stabilizations, we didn't find that sort of magic aggregate um, descriptor to determine what is the best method of, of slurry for application. We did see some positive and negative changes in time. However, for the commercially treated surfaces, we saw a really significant difference between the firmness and stability measurements. And we saw a downward trend, a negative benefit with time in terms of stability, where for the Portland cement and volcanic ash treated lots, we saw a pretty stable or not negative trend in stability and firmness. So that concludes my uh, presentation and webinar. I really appreciate you all. I know that um, webinars uh, used to be sort of a novel idea, and now it seems that all of us are spending more and more time in front of our computers listening to people talk. Um, so, but I, I really do appreciate all the time and the attention uh, given to this work. And certainly thank you to the National Institute for Transportation and Communities for hosting this webinar. So um, I can take questions if anybody has them. Yeah, yeah, um, please submit your questions. Um, that, that was a wonderful presentation, Matthew. I, I, I really enjoyed, um, you know, the, the history of it. Um, and then also the idea that it might be coming back forward um, again. Um, so you, I believe you have given um, some presentations around um, and, and you did talk about the conversation, the main issue being uh, the variability. And I could understand that, you know, if um, someone is, is uh, constructing a, a ADA pathway, they obviously don't want to take too many chances. Can you talk about some of the other possible barriers, um, cost, um, just maybe sort of adoption? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, just like, you know, Portland Cement is a, uh, it's, as I talked about, it's a manufactured product. And really for what it is, it's relatively inexpensive, right? I mean, we're talking about taking usually three or four more uh, different sourced materials, combining them in a kiln, 2000 degrees, um, and then taking the material and crushing it to a fine powder. And then you can go to Home Depot and buy an 80 pound bag of it for five or, five or six dollars. And the reason why, so I think cost is a big issue. The reason why Portland cement is relatively cheap is because we have that infrastructure in place to create Portland cement and distribute Portland cement. Um, whereas with this volcanic ash material, because it's really specific to a region, for example, we were looking at volcanic ashes here in Southern Oregon, um, the infrastructure isn't necessarily there to process this material and distribute the material. The producers right now, for example, um, one producer uh, that I talked to is just using the gravel portion of, of the pumice and the volcanic ash. And the dust is just a byproduct, and it's something that is actually disposed of in sort of a negative fashion. However, if we had a mechanism at that particular location to collect this material, then all of a sudden it, it becomes more readily available. So I think cost is certainly an issue. And then also, um, every volcanic ash is a little bit different. So this volcanic ash is from Mount Mazama, which is a little bit different than the volcanic ash from Mount St. Helens, which is a little bit different than the volcanic ash from Southern Idaho. So 
So just like when you um, are finding a new source of aggregate for from a, a new quarry, for example, in a transportation uh, sense, you have to do many tests to make sure that that aggregate is going to meet all of your requirements. And we would have to do that same level of testing at every new quarry location for this material. So I think that that's probably um, some of the, the bigger issues that I've seen and actually I've talked to people. Um, I've presented this work um, at least, uh, I've had three presentations on this work um, at the ASCE Geo, uh, Geo Congress that has occurred. And uh, the biggest hindrance has been the availability of the material. However, there is a lot of interest in using it, if nothing else, just from its sustainability and reducing its carbon footprint. Nice. So is this something uh, that will continue to be researched at uh, Oregon Tech then? Yes, I, I, I believe we are going to continue this work. One, uh, one thing uh, is that these, we did a lot of um, work with the trail, the, the, the stabilized trail here at Oregon Tech. Um, so we monitored that for several months and then winter happened. And so now we're sort of emerging from winter. And so as soon as we can kind of safely get back to campus, uh, I hope to get sort of the post winter um, results of firmness and stability on this trail to really see um, how a typical weathering cycle affected both the volcanic ash in Portland cement, and then also these commercially treated lots. So I think that that, um, that data will be really, really interesting as soon as we can go out there and collect it. Nice. So I think when you're talking about the, the ADA accessible trails, um, part of that is is just like a, a really, um, you know, great project uh, to, to make a difference and also a really good challenge. What sort of other um, projects um, do you think would be sort of meeting both of those criteria, do you see? That's a good, you know, that's a really good, it's a really good question. Um, I think that, uh, you know, access, so um, when, in terms of sustainability, uh, as I said, you know, I, I studied sustainability just as a, as a, a student, um, but in terms of my research, I haven't done a lot with sustainable solutions. And, um, quite frankly, up until a couple of years ago, I hadn't really even seen these three pillars of sustainability. Um, I would just been sort of think of sustainable solutions as something that protects the environment. But when you think about these other two pillars, um, both the economic and then the, the equity aspect, um, I find that that's, that's really an interesting piece. And I think that that is something um, that's really a I have to admit that's something that's really appealing to a lot of our students. A lot of our students that study, you know, I, I teach civil engineering, they really like to have that human connection to their work. And I think it's one of the pieces that we don't um, highlight well enough in civil engineering is that our work is really on infrastructure and it's about connecting people to the infrastructure around us. So in terms of, of um, access, I think that um, that is something that is really, really interesting here. And what I'd like to see, um, the beneficial designs rotational penetrometer, it's a really interesting uh, device to measure these firmness and stability of, of these surfaces. However, I would like to expand on exactly how do you quantify firmness and stability. I think that there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, whenever you have, as I said, whenever you have a word that describes something, I think engineers become uncomfortable because it is more difficult to describe something with a word as opposed to a number. And so I think really, um, really quantifying those firmness and stabilities of different surfaces, I think that's something where there is a lot of work that can be done. And I also think that it's an area that um, uh, is, is a place where civil engineers, um, designers, and planners, and researchers can really do a lot of good, is looking at the surface itself. I mean, in transportation infrastructure, surfaces surfaces are, are the game, right? I mean, Portland cement, and 
and um, as, uh, asphalt pavements. Uh, these are these are where where the the rubber hits the road, for example. And so I think uh, in terms of access, it, firmness and stability is really an area where there's a lot of work to be done. That's great. Um, we have another question. Is current ASTM C618 useful and reliable in screening natural pozzolans? So that's a great question, and and it is. It is very, very useful for screening any potential natural pozzolan. Um, the problem with with um, screening natural pozzolans uh, that you'll see, I actually, when we were looking at this pozzolan, because we knew that we weren't using it strictly as a replacement for Portland cement in a mixed design, we only relied on three of the several different areas of uh, that you need in order to classify something as a class N pozzolan. So we looked at chemical composition, strength, and fineness. Um, the drawback of that standard is the expense associated with screening a natural pozzolan. You have to do, um, there are some soundness tests and other uh, types of sulfate tests that you have to run in order to classify something as a class N pozzolan. These tests are not run very uh, very often, and of course, therefore, they're very expensive. So to run the whole suite of the ASTM is very expensive, and also it's a very um, it's a different it's a difficult suite of tests to find a lab to run them for you. Um, what I find most beneficial is really the, the chemical composition. Um, if you have you know a pozzolan is a pozzolan, so if you have the right chemistry. You have a puzzle. I think that there's not there's not a lot of variability there. If you find a deposit like um, Mount Mazama ash that is nearly pure silica, then it's going to be a natural puzzle on. And then just like with Portland cement, um, as long as you get that powdered fine enough, it's going to behave like a natural puzzle on in terms of strength. Um, and then if you don't have the sulfur trioxide in it from the chemical analysis, you're not going to get a lot of the negative things that can occur. So it is a great starting point. The drawback is that it is expensive and difficult to find um, the laboratories to perform all the testing. Great. <clears throat> we have a, another question. How applicable could volcanic ash be when used in hydraulic situations? Um, for example, concrete line channels or concrete pipes? Uh, that, that's a good question. Now, that um, for the concrete line pipes, depending on what you're transporting in the pipe, then you have to be more concerned sort of about the, the, the salts and the sulfate attacks and that sort of thing. Um, but for if we're transporting water, this um, this volcanic ash can certainly be used. And I, I really feel that um, even with the, the tests that we've run, the chemical and strength tests, really shows that with some processing, this is a fine product. And um, I think that you're gonna get the same benefits that you'll see if you used fly ash in your mixed design. So you'll see um, a long-term strength gain, you'll see reduced heat of hydration, um, all sorts of different things. Uh, particularly, you know, the chemical composition of fly ash in this material is, is nearly identical. And so um, it's absolutely fine. The, the tests that I've run, I feel, make this material very useful in those applications. Um, if we were transporting something other than water, then I would want to, to check on uh, some of the sulfate uh, resistance um, of the material. Great. Um, you talked about your uh, data sets and you showed that graph as, um, as a, something that, that could really help people who are looking to use it out. Um, what else have you seen um, as far as other research results? That's, um, that's really, that's a, yeah, that's a really great question. You know, part of this, um, you know, this, it's really, I, I mean, I, I consider myself to be pretty good at finding information. 
I mean, I think when you when you write a dissertation, right? I mean, you know, most of your time is spent just finding who else has done the work. And there are some there are some really great, and they're referenced in the final report, really great articles that used volcanic ash in a very, very similar way in application. Um, and the thing that's really exciting about some of the pre other work is that we're looking at uh, volcanic ashes from around the world. Um, there's, I referenced some volcanic ashes that are from, I believe it was Bangladesh, uh, some from Taiwan, uh, some from India. Um, I've had interest uh, from uh, some Pakistani researchers that are using a uh, volcanic ash. Um, and so uh, also New Zealand, I believe. So there are, a, there are some really interesting results from other researchers that are using volcanic ash from completely different locations. However, when you, like I said earlier, when you look chemically at the material, it's very similar. A felsic eruptive event, which is a highly silicious magma with high viscosity, um, is going to be very similar. There will be slight differences, but it'll be very similar between sort of a Mount St. Helens to a crater lake um, to another felsic eruption on the other side of the world. And their results are very, very similar. Um, and actually, I have some, some really some fun and interesting graphs in the report where I just take their data sets whenever they performed very similar tests to what I have run. Or I won't say I, to where my students have run in the lab and uh, compare the results. And actually what we find is, is very, very high correlation, um, particularly with the strength of my data and international researching data. Um, some really, really interesting results. Um, one researcher had a very, very similar chemical composition, volcanic ash um, to mine, and um, they, the data set nearly plots right on top of each other, um, particularly at these low replacements. Um, and so that that was a really, really positive finding because you never want to rely on, you know, you want to make sure that you're you're not an outlier in your data. So I think that that was really beneficial. Um, I've also sent, um, like I said, my concrete canoe team uses this volcanic ash. Uh, I've sent this volcanic ash to some other colleagues at other universities that teach materials classes, and they've been using it um, in their materials classes as they do Portland cement concrete mix designs. Um, and so we actually have sort of an unofficial uh, set of data where um, we're sort of all making Portland cement concrete mixes in our undergraduate classes as well. And that data also seems to be very, very similar. So. Yeah, there are um, some other researchers out there looking at very similar materials. Yeah, and you did mention uh, University of Texas Austin replacing some fly ash, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so that's a good example of um, of yeah how you're sharing all this information. Absolutely, they were they are you know their study um, they looked at, at many different sources of natural fossil. So a natural pozzolan could also be um, could be found in certain clay mineralogies. Um, uh, we also have a deposit here in southern Oregon of diatomaceous earth. Uh, diatomaceous earth is also nearly a pure silica material. Um, so I'm interested to see if it would behave in a similar way as this volcanic ash. Um, so they looked at a lot of different natural pozzolans, and, and yeah, they're, they're you know they are looking for a replacement for fly ash, sort of looking. 10, 15, 20 years down the road, if we continue to burn less coal, uh, we will need to find a replacement for all the benefits that fly ash gives us in our Portland cement designs. And so they looked at this as well. That's great. Um, so we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, are there any, if there are any more questions, um, this is your last opportunity to submit it. Um, Matthew, this has been a great webinar. Um, it was really fascinating. I think I'll um, share with people that that that, uh, that information about Mount Mazama. That was really cool. Um, yeah, I have to admit that my initial, you know, my my undergraduate degree is in geological engineering, and so I would be upset if I didn't spend a little bit of time talking about the geologic history of Crater Lake 
in this webinar. Nice, nice. That's great. All right. So um, with that, we're going to conclude. I want to remind you on Friday at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time, we're going to have a presentation on understanding technology-based exclusion and emerging smart mobility systems uh, by Dr. Aaron Golub and John MacArthur. Um, on June 2nd, we have a presentation at 11 a.m. Pacific time by Dr. Jennifer Dill and Nathan McNeil, and that's on findings from 15 years of travel surveys at Portland area transit oriented developments. So this concludes the webinar. I want to thank you all for attending. Um, I want to thank Matthew for presenting um, and uh, take care. <laughs>